Hello there. Welcome, everyone. I hope you've all had a. Oh, thank you. Uh, hope you've all had a beautiful day, enjoying the outdoors here on the vineyard, all it has to offer. Uh, and now we're going to have um, even more fun, in a way, uh, by enjoying this fellowship and watching this wonderful movie together, The River and the Wall. And then also um, having the capability of bringing so many talented people together, five speakers tonight to talk afterwards, to talk a little bit more about future policy, challenges, uh, opportunities for um, immigrants and refugee seekers and asylum seekers and refugees. And, uh, and so I'm not going to talk about the speakers. I'm going to let Anita to do that. But, but I did want to mention that this film um, covers a wide base of issues, not just immigration. Uh, there's certainly that aspect to it. But the original uh, concept about the film, Ben Masters, the director, was to go visit the border, the Texas-Mexican border, primarily the Rio Grande uh, River area, 1,200 miles of it, um, and to look and see what really exists there before any major changes would take place because of the proposed border wall. And I think most people leaving the theater tonight after watching this movie are going to come away with a newfound sort of um, uh, uh, sort of experience about what it is that we have on our border. Uh, I don't know how many people have actually visited the border between Texas and Mexico. I don't think a lot of Americans have actually done that. Um, and I think you're going to find out a lot of interesting things. But it was really just these five individuals that wanted to travel this um, 1,200 miles to really see the pristine uh, sort of uh, outdoor environment, the nature that exists, and then also, of course, the human element. So uh, without further ado, I know Sam, uh, who's the co-founder of the Exodus Institute, is going to say a few words, and then he's going to turn it over to Anita, and then we'll be off to the races. And we're going to be off very quickly. <laughs> Richard, thank you for partnering with us thank for this you. event. And the stars have a line on Martha's Vineyard to create the Exodus Institute. And it's an amazing story. And one of these days when we have more time, we'll talk about it. But one of the stars that did align was meeting Anita Body, who is our executive director. And, thank you. and she's, she's a full-time resident of, the Mar of Martha's Vineyard, and I'm a resident of Chilmark. And Anita has brought Ann Gallagher along, who runs our Washington office. And so we thank you for being here tonight and participating in this event. Uh, we hope one of these days to take this uh, festival on the road. And with your help, maybe the first stop will be Washington. Thank you very much, and thank you, Sam. Uh, I'm just going to say a couple of things, and then we're going to get to the movies. Uh, and that is basically the, the strategy of Exodus is to. I can't read the, plan. the strategy of Exodus is very simple. It's to educate, to advocate, and to facilitate, and to facilitate organizations and public, you know, the public awareness and the policies in in the United States. God help us if we could do it globally. Um, I I think I just want to stress something, and that is that the public awareness today in the United States of the centrality of immigration to our American history and to democracy is somehow being lost. And I think we have to continue to, you know, to make that a mantra. It is part of who we are. And one of the things we're going to do after the movie, and it'll be brief, so I'm telling you now, is that we're planning to compile a report a report based on the policy recommendations that come out, and certainly from a number of the NGOs that are here, and we're grateful that they are here and the speakers. Uh, and we will share these recommendations. Some of you have already given us recommendations over the last three days, the last two days. But please, please, you know, come up to us, talk with us, because we're going to do that. And as Sam said, we're hoping to take the show on the road. But we want to share these recommendations, so you need to be watching our website. 
And last but not least, <laughs> you will see, some of you have seen it before, Exodus sponsored videos of university students. And we did it with Georgetown University, we did it with the University of North Carolina, and the new school, and I forget where else we're doing it, but you're gonna see two uh, short uh, videos made by university students, and they're both from the University of North Carolina. So, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Abramowitz. I am the president of Freedom House, which is an international American NGO dedicated to the defense of democracy around the world. We have a great panel today. We're going to be joined tonight by Ambassador Milan Verveer, who is the executive director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security at Georgetown University. Esther Oliveria, the former administration former Obama administration official uh, for the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Tolu Olabumi, to, to my right, uh, the founder and CEO of Lions Right, and David Shahulian, counsel to the U.S. Congress and a veteran of the Hill on immigration issues, among other things. So welcome, thank you all for staying. Uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna have a conversation for a bit about two two big subjects, which is you know what are the forces that are driving the immigration crisis, including some of the newer forces, and also what to do about it. But I thought that was such a powerful movie and a, such a powerful case against the border wall that I just wanted to ask anyone here on the panel if they wanted to say anything just about their just quick reactions to that movie. Anyone? It's powerful. Yeah. Okay. All right. Malayan, why don't we just start with you then. Uh, one of the issues that you work on at Georgetown uh, is the intersection between uh, climate, gender, and conflict. And uh, can you, first of all, just explain to us why climate has such a unique and increased impact on women and, uh, and girls around the world? Thank you, Michael. And let me just begin by... Uh, thanking the Exodus Institute for this powerful tool. And I do hope, Anita, that it goes ac across the country and maybe you could start in Washington, where it is most needed. Before I say a little bit about women and girls, I just want to put this in context. Uh, because climate change is already and will continue to create massive displacement and the greatest numbers of those displaced are women, particularly from the Global South. Just to understand how significant this is, there are 40-some uh, million uh, who, out of the 68.5 million uh, who have been displaced, that are displaced within their countries. Uh, so it's internal displacement and the great majority of that displacement uh, is due to natural disasters, which of course, as we all know, uh, are growing. The uh, former High Commissioner uh, for Refugees and the current Secretary General of the United Nations said, I am convinced that climate change will increasingly be a driver of a worsening displacement crisis in the world. The Earth's climate is changing at a rate that has exceeded most scientific forecasts, and these conditions have forced more and more people to leave their homes. And it's appropriate, obviously, that we be discussing climate uh, in the context of a, a series of films having to do uh, with migrants and refugees. In the last decade, an average of 24 million people have been displaced, by catastrophic weather disasters every year. And we know what those disasters are like, storms that are getting stronger, water shortages, uh, depletion of arable lands, all kinds of horrible situations that are driving people uh, forcibly from where they currently live. And someone had call, has called this, and I think it says it all, which are disasters on steroids. Uh, and that's essentially what we're up against. 
Now, a recent World Bank study estimates that more than 140 million people could be displaced by climate change uh, by mid-century. And just in the last year, we've seen tremendous displacements in Afghanistan, uh, in Somalia, those have been driven by severe drought conditions. Uh, and, you know, you can say, well, maybe they'll go back. Somalia is, is a situation of constant uh, drought conditions, so there is no way uh, to go back in these situations. Already in Bangladesh, the rising sea levels and flooding uh, are uprooting tens of thousands along the coastal area uh, and destroying livelihoods and uh, the future that goes with all of that. You know, Bangladesh, it, it, this is such a real topic there uh, that it's the one place that I visited where the first thing the Prime Minister wanted to talk about was climate because it is having such a severe uh, impact on her country and it's a daily reality. You know, in the South Pacific, I remember not too long ago being in Papua New Guinea, uh, meeting with a group of women from the islands, and when they introduced themselves and said where they were from, one of them said, I'm from Tuvalu, the first island that will be underwater. Uh, that's the reality that we don't always uh, feel that cognizant of or that close. Uh, but it is happening, and it is happening significantly. And although this displacement is taking place mostly within countries, uh, it also is happening across national borders. And, and this is where we come to Michael in terms of the conflict piece, because this can lead to conflict, uh, because climate is a multiplier threat, uh, food and water shortages, the competition for diminishing resources provoke violence and conflict and compound the displacement. Uh, so that's a snapshot, and, and you saw, uh, or you know, because it's the reality that we're hearing about with all the border um, discussions that are going on, uh, that in Central America, with large numbers of people trying to leave, they are leaving horrible conflict situations, gang wars, if you will, but they are also, those situations are compounded by increasing drought conditions, particularly in Guatemala, and you've got that double situation acting on people uh, and forcing them to leave. Now, why are women critical? Climate, all of the consequences of climate change that I briefly mentioned uh, disproportionately impact women. Uh, due to their socioeconomic uh, situation, the political situation, the barriers that women confront, uh, and the norms that they live with. Uh, there are serious gendered dimensions to the consequences of climate change. For example, the water scarcity and droughts uh, really affect the great majority of farm farmers in the Global South who are women, 80% uh, and upwards in Africa. They can no longer eke out an existence in those conditions. Um, and that's obviously has tremendous impacts uh, on their lives. The division of labor that women are up against, I uh, call it in a very genteel way, the management of households. But the bottom, uh, bottom line is they have to do everything. And one of the, the things they have to do is make sure there is water uh, and make sure there is firewood for the way that they uh, are able to cook, etc. Uh, those chores are becoming increasingly difficult uh, because the water is disappearing uh, and the distances that women and girls have to travel to procure it uh, are becoming lengthier uh, as well as um, the situation that they confront uh, in finding wood. So climate change has these severe consequences um, on women, but there's another part of these consequences, and that is that they're being excluded from the decision-making tables, from the platforms where they can actually have impact uh, on this situation. 
Uh, so, you know, that's not the whole story, the victim side of the story. The other side of the story for women is that they're agents of change. And they really have to become a more central part of adaptation and mitigation efforts. Uh, and in fact, as my colleagues here on the panel will go on to discuss what can be done about this, one of the hopes is that some of this will be stalled uh, and the consequences to climate change won't be as severe as what we're already seeing. For that to happen, women need to be more engaged. Uh, they're already tremendously engaged in resilience efforts, in what's happening in terms of uh, different agricultural uh, techniques. They're involved in renewables. Tens of thousands of women in Bangladesh, for example, are installing solar panels. Uh, others are selling renewable products like solar lamps, moving to clean cook stoves that are spewing uh, this black carbon. Uh, and that's just scratching the surface of what they are doing, but so much more needs to be done uh, to unleash the potential uh, that they represent in the areas of adaptation and uh, mitigation. Uh, lastly, I just want to say two lines uh, about what will be discussed next by the experts sitting here uh, in terms of what can we do in the various forums uh, with laws, with the United Nations, protocols, etc. Um, and that is that these climate migrants, they're not refugees, they don't fit the refugee definition of people escaping uh, war and uh, persecution. But they really need protection. We are currently seeing a massive protection gap. And the big question is what is going to happen uh, to the migrant, uh, migrants who are displaced because of climate change and potentially more significantly displaced in the future. Thank you. I'd like to turn now to uh, Tolu. And uh, before I ask you about what the UN is doing about this issue, I'd like, to tell, I'd like you to tell the audience a little about yourself and how you kind of came to this issue. Thank you so much. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here. And I'm so thrilled that the Exodus Institute has put this on. Um, you know, I've made some dear friends in, in our time here, and we were having a conversation Saturday morning after seeing uh, the movie Midnight Traveler, which if you weren't here on Friday night for it, I highly recommend checking it out. It talks, it, it's a movie about the three-year journey. It, it showcases a three-year journey of a family, a refugee family from Afghanistan that fled and found their way to Europe. Um, through leaky boats and deadly border crossing with two little girls um, and struggling through every single day to keep hope alive, um, to keep themselves alive, to get to a better life. And as we were sitting Saturday morning and we were talking about that movie and talking about kind of my experience with it, I couldn't help but go to a moment last spring when I went scuba diving for the first time. And while underwater, 40 feet plus underwater, I had a little bit of an incident. And, you know, figured it out. When I got back up, a friend that was with me, who she's, you know, she scuba dived many times before, and she was like, so how was it? You know, did you like it? And I was like, yeah, it was fantastic. But there was a little something that happened. She's like, what was it? I was like, well, at one point, my throat closed up, um, and I really had a, a hard time breathing, but I, I think I just wasn't using the equipment right. You know, I thought I understood what we're supposed to do, but clearly I missed something. Um, and she's like, Tolly, you had a panic attack, 40 plus feet underwater, and you figured it out. You wrote it out off as an, an equipment malfunction. And for me, in that moment with her saying that, it was like, wow, what skills do you have to have? What does a person have to have gone through to be able to have a, a panic attack 40, 40 plus feet underwater and get through it without panicking? I came to the US when I was 14 years old. I'm currently an advisor, well, now I'm, I, I run the UN's climate action campaign and served as an advisor to their Department of Global Communications. When I came to the U.S. at 14 from Nigeria, I knew I wanted to be an engineer. 
the UN was not on my radar at all. Knowing I wanted to be an engineer, I had the skills to do it, and I pursued that goal across oceans. Got here, went to high school, got a full scholarship to a fantastic university, got my chemical engineering degree as hard as it was, and soon after graduating, I realized that I'd lost access to my legal immigration status, and I'd become undocumented. I'd become what I often refer to as living in the gray, the colorless existence of the paperless, shrouded in fear and hidden in the shadows. Being undocumented meant that that dream, that little girl of eight, carried across oceans could not be a reality. And I was lost. I didn't know what to do. But in that, I remember the fact that this is my home. And I love this country. And if, as I've always said, I'm American, what am I doing to prove that? How am I building a more perfect union for us all? And for me, that translated to advocating. I couldn't vote, but I could advocate. So I found the guy that helped write a bill that would help young people who had come to the US at a young age, through no fault of, their, for, fault of their own, had no legal immigration status, but were destined for great things. I found him and I said, listen, I want to help. I'm an engineer. I can answer phones, solve papers. I could probably tell you how the phone works, but I'll settle <laughs> with just answering the phone. And he hired me on the spot. I was the first and only undocumented immigrant working full time advocating for DREAM Act, for the DREAM Act and for comprehensive immigration reform. They'd never seen anything like me. There's still memos from the ACLU on can we give her funds to be able to catch the bus to come to work for free. I had to take out credit card loans to be able to work for free. I was working 80, 90 hours a week. My work was my life, my life was my work. And I stayed doing that work because, and not, not necessarily for me. You know, I, I thought maybe the bill might help me, but more importantly, I met other people, other incredible human beings that deserved a chance at their dream, whatever it might be. And I started advocating fiercely on the Hill, and I would go to these members of Congress, and I, they would always assume that I was a lawyer with the immigrant advocacy group I, I, um, I was working with. Apparently, I, I have the air of an attorney. I, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> um, and they would say, you know, you just don't understand. These people don't speak English. They don't understand us. What we need are STEM graduates. If we had that, we could work this out. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Damn graduates. Okay, well, let me tell you my story. You know, it, 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 it wasn't an easy thing for me to do. As a Nigerian, this was a dirty secret for us. It was not, my father was a rule of law kind of guy, and this is not something that my family wanted for me. It was not planned, it happened, but we had to deal with it. But in those rooms, realizing that the clearly untold story of an African, a black female chemical engineer that's incidentally leading this work nationally to be able to give access to legal status to millions of young people and their families. The fact that that story was unfamiliar to our legislators that were writing laws that would change not only the lives of those undocumented immigrants, but ours as well. And as you've seen through the, this movie, would change our ecosystem, how we engage with nature in our backyard. I knew that I needed to advocate, so I started doing that with significant risk to myself. I could be chained, I could be deported, but I was advocating. I was a founding board member of the largest immigrant youth-led organization in the nation, the United Lutheran Network. The first time I wrote my first press release, being an engineer, I knew nothing about any of these things, nothing about policy, nothing about communications. But I had my supervisor, two months into my tenure, come into um, my little workspace and go, you know, the DREAM Act is being reintroduced next week, and we need to draft a press release. Can you handle that? Do you want to give it, a, uh, give it a try and see? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And I immediately went home and Googled press release. I had no <laughs> idea what a press release was. But from that press release, I became the founding communications director of United to DREAM Network. And for that organization as well as your communication spe specialist on the Dream Act. And I went from there, little by little, advocating on the Hill, sharing my story, helping to draft and redraft 
different iterations of, of the DREAM Act and working with those that were on it to make sure that those that were directly connected with the issue, those that are living in this, were actually part of the conversation. My organization, Lions Right, which I was telling you about, is based on my favorite African proverb that says, until the lion learns to write, all the stories will glorify the hunter. When you focus on those that you are trying to help, thank you. When you focus on those directly affected, there is a pride that is ignited within them. There is an authenticity of purpose that comes to the work that you are trying to do that raises them beyond their circumstances, raises you beyond what you thought you could do. And that's what I've been doing. And that work took me from advocating as a non-paid volunteer to helping with the 2013 immigration bill to the World Economic Forum and now to the United Nations. But through all of that, it was a struggle, it was pain, it was hardship. Through those years came the skills that allowed me to be 40 feet underwater and get through it. But I'm not sure it's something we should be proud of. Because I'm not sure that skill is something I would want for my own daughter when I have her one day. I'm not sure I would want her to have to struggle in this way to be able to just live free and do what she wants to do. But I am so honored to be in this room with all of you because you are here today and you are a testament to the fact that we can do better. There are some skills that we don't need to have, not all of us anyways. As one of my friends always says, some of us are made to breathe oxygen and others of us are made to create oxygen. Not all of us needs, need those skills. And I'm so thrilled that you are here because each of you has a role to play in making sure that those that do not need those skills are not forced into developing that or breaking them and making them lose their dreams along the way. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to turn to our uh, policy, to policy experts, Esther and David, to talk a little bit about you know, what we should be doing about this crisis that was uh, you know, alluded to in the movie and on stage by uh, Alain <laughs> Tolu. Uh, what are, if the border wall is not a workable solution, uh, what other kinds of changes to uh, U.S. immigration law or other policy changes must be needed to address uh, the crisis? Why don't you go first? Okay, let, let me first start by answering your first question about the film. And I, I think that this film should be required viewing for every member of Congress oh, yeah. before they vote on the next, the next legislation for the wall. And I, in my capacity, when I, I worked in the Senate for many years, or Senator Kennedy, when I worked at the Department of Homeland Security, I went to the border many, many times. But I never saw the border like I saw in this film. Um, and, and to see how ludicrous it is um, to build a wall in so many of these sections. Now, um, turning to what can be done. Um, so, many of us um, who have been on these panels tonight and, and the previous nights have been working on immigration reform for a long, long time. I first started working on it in 2001. Um, we, we actually, and, and Mark was there and Wendy was there, um, we thought we were going to get this done immediately. We had a um, comprehensive group of members of Congress. We had a hearing on September 7th, um, and, and on the morning of um, September, um, um, on September 11th, we were actually gathered to start writing the bill um, when we learned that the planes had hit the World Trade Center. And we knew, forget it, we are never going to be doing comprehensive immigration reform anytime soon, and everything was shelved. And it took us several years to get back and we tried in 2000, well, we tried with the McCain-Kennedy bill that got to the, um, to the Senate, um, passed the Senate in 2006, but the Republican House leadership refused to take it up. Um, then in 2007, we tried again. And by this time, President Bush um, was fully engaged and decided this was something that he wanted to do. But by then, he had no political capital to bring around the Republicans that we needed to get the Senate when we fell short. 
And then we knew again that there was no hope again until we got through um, and into an, another administration. Um, there was an attempt in, in 2012, uh, no, let me go back, after, after President Obama was elected, there was an attempt to, to do it, um, but we, again, within the administration and within the Congress, there was no political will to take this on because it is such a difficult issue. Um, and the, the next time we got close, <laughs> um, David and I were involved again in, in the struggle, um, it was in, in 2013, and we were able to get a really good bill, probably the best bill that has ever passed the, um, a, a chamber through the Senate. But again, um, Republican leadership in the House lacked the political will to bring a bill to the floor. And David can talk more because he was very intimately involved in those negotiations. But all this to say is it's really damn hard to get comprehensive immigration reform done. And it's, and it's also just really complicated and you just can't do one little piece like um, legislation to legalize the dreamers like TULIP. You need to provide some kind of legal status for the huge undocumented population here. You need to provide changes to the law. You saw um, uh, a number of the employers talking and, and the people in the film talking about how there aren't um, enough visas to allow people to come into the country legally. We haven't changed our legal visa system since 1990. So the numbers that we're looking at for employers are the same numbers that we've had since 1990. Our, our economy has changed significantly since that time. We're looking at the same numbers for family reunification. However, the number of people, the numbers of families that need to be reunited has grown astronomically. So people don't have legal means to wait, and they're desperate, and they come whichever way they can. Um, um, I'm going to stop there, turn it to David, so we can have a conversation about this, because I think it's probably best done through a conversation. I mean, if I could, David, turn it to you. I uh, want to hear your ideas on the policy side, but you know, one issue that I'm wondering if you could specifically address in your comments is the fact that, you know, for better or worse, there's a great deal of anxiety mm -hmm. in this country when you know, a large population, a large part of the population that we've kind of lost control of the borders. And so how do you, in some ways, you know, recognize that while also recognizing some of the other needs that are attended in, uh, in, in immigration reform, i.e., is there some kind of compromise that could be had in the Congress that addresses both those concerns? I mean, I think that's right. There's, there is a, a large part of the population that is driven to some degree by rule of law, uh, this idea that we've lost control. I mean, largely they, I mean, a lot, like, like a lot of the, you know, a lot of us here watching this movie, we're just unfamiliar with the reality. We're unfamiliar with border terrain or what drives people to come or what our laws are like. Most people think that people should get in line and then come the right way. But the reality is for most people in the world, um, even for uh, people we need in order to fill our, our labor needs, there is no line. There just is no line to get into. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, as... Um, We've had, a, we've had a number of witnesses in a bazillion hearings. I've uh, uh, joined the Hill back in 2007, but one of my favorite was Richard Land, the former uh, president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, and he, uh, one of the hearings said, you know, for, for decades we had two signs at the border. One said, no trespassing. The other said, help wanted. And that's kind of been the reality of our, of our immigration system for a long time. And so now we have to deal with it. You know, um, I just want another quick... Uh, you know, a uh, little point, back in 1950, about uh, half of our population uh, lacked a high school diploma. That's now less than 5%. I mean, we're just not, you know, demographically, people, you know, we're not raising Americans to go work in the fields yet. We have a giant agricultural sector. They're not working, they're, you know, they're not wanting to go to, you know, poultry processing or cattle raising or dairy production, uh, uh, manufacturing in some parts. I mean, there's just, all, uh, you know, textile industry is largely gone, but in the places where it exists, it is largely uh, led by immigrant and refugee communities. Anyway, so, um, you know, we do have to find a way of talking about immigration in a way that both is true to our values, but does speak to middle America, and it's, I think, uh, an issue that the Democrats have had a hard time with, and, you know, there's, we're trying to find our way, but I do want to talk about, if I can, just the kind of the border situation. You know, a lot of people ask, you know, how should we deal with this crisis? And I think there is a simple solution. This is going to sound funny at first, but I'm going to explain in a second, which is,
take what this administration is do it, doing and do almost the exact opposite of it. Um, so let me just, uh, so I'm going to now just break that down a tiny bit and I'll do this as quickly as I can. But um, the number one thing you would uh, not do is cut off money and financial aid to the countries that are sending these, uh, you know, the people over now, right? The people are leaving. Uh, that's the absolute worst thing. I do want to tell a quick story. I was um, with a, a bipartisan congressional delegation, and we were we had gone to the Venezuelan Colombian border, and then we were uh, making our way through Central America and to Mexico. Uh, we were in El Salvador. We had just met with the new president-elect, um, and then we. Uh, uh, went to the U.S. ambassador's house, and she is a um, a very capable ambassador, probably one of the best uh, in our State Department. And um, we were this. Uh, the ambassador was uh, surrounded by DHS officials, FBI officials, uh, other uh, individuals from the Department of Justice who were, and they were giving us a presentation of all the great things they were doing in El Salvador. They had, um, you know, the investments in education, but also in just. Um, bringing down MS-13 gang cells, both in the U.S. and in El Salvador, the, the cross, you know, the, the cooperation between our two nations, but just all the great things they were doing, which had, at that point, brought the homicide rate uh, in El Salvador down by 50% year to year. I mean, that's a massive decrease, and we were, and that was paying off in the sense that numbers of people leaving El Salvador for the United States were rapidly declining. Um, and we're sitting there, uh, uh, you know, with uh, hearing the uh, ambassador speak when we got the, she got a text message um, indicating uh, to her that the president had just tweeted that he was about to cut off all funding to Central American countries, including El Salvador. And everybody in that room, Democrat or Republican, conservative or liberal, everybody was just aghast, right? Because everybody knew that was the exact wrong thing to do. Uh, you know, people don't leave their countries for the United States if they have hope, if they have opportunity, if, they're, you know, if they have uh, a future for their kids. They just don't do it. I mean, this is why you're not seeing increased immigration from you know, Costa Rica or Belize or Panama or even Nicaragua, even though the, uh, the country's deteriorating a bit. Um, you know, you're, it's not our laws that are broken in that sense. It's not our laws that are bringing, that there are pull factors uh, that are, are causing these pull factors, but it's really these push factors, these three countries that are falling apart. And if we don't deal with those in our backyard, these people are going to continue to come. So you, you would do that. You wouldn't uh, ostracize and bully other countries in the region. You would work with them to increase their uh, humanitarian capacity, their ability to take refugees and asylees, so that there's shared responsibility in the region. Right? It's working with our partners in the region so that we are all working on this together rather than kind of this go it alone mentality. The other thing you wouldn't do is you wouldn't close down the legal avenues that people can invest in so that they don't have to come irregularly. Uh, you know, uh, under the last administration that I was also a part of with Esther, you know, we had created various programs. It was a Central American Miners Program for the children of people who were lawfully residing in the United States to be able to reunify legally rather than having to take this uh, dangerous journey through, uh, through uh, uh, you know, Mexico. There were, uh, we would have increased refugee numbers, and particularly numbers uh, to Central America and the region, rather than cutting them drastically below, you know, numbers that are not, and, and you know, this administration is not talking about bringing that number down to zero. Um, just, you would just create other avenues for people to come, because when people have legal avenues, they use those rather than go in regularly. Um, you wouldn't. One of the other things that I love to talk about is the fact that if you want to really manage migration, even at our own southern border, you want people to do it, you know, the, in the most orderly way pro uh, possible. You would want them to come to ports of entry and apply for asylum at the ports, and there's where you can process them and figure out whether, you know, they need to be held for a little bit of time, or they can be released, or they could be put into a case management program or something so they can be tracked, and you can ensure that they are you know, complying, showing up to proceedings, know where to go. You would do all of that. You wouldn't close the ports. You know, at the same time, I just want to be very clear about this. The administration was asking people to come to ports of entry. They were engaging in policies to prevent people from applying for asylum at those very ports. They're engaged in things called metering, where they're basically saying, we'll take 10 people a day at, at different ports. Everybody else, you have to wait, and you get in the line, and maybe, you know, we'll see you tomorrow, or maybe we'll see you in three months. Or they would, you know, the return to Mexico policy, where they say, you know what, we're going to just let you stay in Mexico, and we'll set your hearing for a year down the road. Um, 
engaging in policies like that, which even the very conservative Border Patrol Union, they oppose those policies because they know that that's just incentivizing people to cross irregularly between the ports of entry, to take these like dangerous journeys through the desert where they're risking their own lives and the lives of our Border Patrol agents. And so they oppose those policies because they'd rather incentivize people to do it uh, regularly. And you would, I uh, just last thing, you would actually fix the infrastructure at our ports, that they're more, you know, the, they're changing demographics now, the people who are coming. It's no longer single adult men from Mexico. The Mexico numbers are declining precipitously. There are now the increases, the people that are coming are these families with children from Central America. So you would have to, you have to create the capacity and, the, and uh, you have to change the infrastructure at our ports in order to handle those people appropriately. You would do a number of things like that, not what this administration is doing. I'll stop. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to ask a question of the group, and maybe start with Milan, which is, I think, if, I, if these numbers serve me, if my memory serves me correctly, we now have like the highest number of displaced people in the world since the end of World War II. And you've got conflict in Syria, you know, the implosion of Venezuela, uh, a conflict in a number of African countries that are, that are fueling this crisis, and now you know, you have reminded us about the potential cataclysmic effect of, uh, of climate change. So we're in a world where there could be even more refugees uh, than we have now. What can we, uh, as a United Nations do, if you will, do to, can do to kind of go to the root and stop this, you know, refugee crisis from metastasizing? One thing you're suggesting is climate, cha climate change mitigation, but are there any other sets of policies that you would recommend to kind of stop this problem from metastasizing? Well, I don't think um, that the policies for the most part that we think about, we worry about how to deal with the refugees and migrants who are already uh, moving in ways that are significant. Um, and to do that, what is in place, the regimens that are in place, are really for humanitarian purposes and for protection purposes. Uh, as I said, if, this, if the climate situation, um, and this is a solution that oftentimes the people in this work are recommending because the current um, frameworks that are in place that address the refugee problem don't address the migrant problem, particularly those that are increasing in terms of climate. Uh, and what is the solution to that going to be? And what many say is, well, let's stop it at its roots as best we can, knowing this thing is spiraling, but we really have to do more on, uh, on adaptation and mitigation. And that is within the construct of some parts of the UN, like the FCCC, which deals with climate, uh, in their purview for how they're going to uh, ensure that more of that happens. But I want to go back really quickly to what David said, uh, because I think while he laid out a very rational course of action, which is what we all want to follow, we're dealing with a lot of fear-mongering. I was checking into a hotel in Uzbekistan a few months ago, and the guy at the desk said to me, you from America? I said, yes. He said, caravans are coming to your country. <laughs> now, this was in Central Asia, and he's talking about the car caravans not because he was afraid, but he was afraid for me and what was going to happen. We're dealing with that and we're dealing with lack of education and information. And I think it goes back to advocacy, but really smart communications policies. We really have to move that more. We're sort of running a little bit out of time, so I'm going to just go, go right down the aisle and just ask uh, the panelists to answer sort of two questions. One is, you can just follow on if you have like a single recommendation that we as a society could deal with to deal with this crisis. You know, something that you think could, there's no, obviously there's no magic bullet or panacea, but is there a specific recommendation that, that you would make to our government to deal with this crisis? And I would say number two, if you can give us some hope, you know, is there anything that people in, a, in, a, in this group might want, might do to kind of contribute to the problem? Well, you go, Esther. Well, I would start that with this government, I don't think that there's anything we can do. I think we need regime change. Um, and, and that should be a top one right now. And so this election, is upcoming election, is probably the most important election of our lifetime. And we all have to do everything that we can 
from not just voting, but convincing anyone that we know to vote, getting out and working, <laughs> getting out of this state, for example, into uh, battleground states to help, contributing money, everything that we can, because I think that's how we're going to start to see changes. Um, and then hopefully if things come our way and we have a progressive administration in place, we need to be as bold as they have been once we get back into power. Um, and, and as someone who was in the Obama administration before, um, it was really frustrating often at times how timidly we acted. Um, and I think if there's one lesson that we've learned from this administration is we have to be bold once we get back in power. Act responsibly, but be bold. Don't be afraid. I agree completely. Um, you know, one thing that I would say that we need to do more is uh, storytelling. There is such tremendous power in storytelling. You hear the stories, you share the stories. Don't live in silos. We have to break down these walls that we've built, you know, literally and figuratively. We have to talk to each other. Um, if someone is spewing hate around you, don't just write them off as some crazy, unjust, you know, whatever it is. Have a dialogue. Of course, keep yourself and your sanity protected at all times, but as much as you can, engage. I think that is so incredibly important. Um, and the other piece that I, I would say, if I could put on my UN climate change hat for a second, it's easy to see kind of my work around people and caring about people when it comes to migration policy. And the people are like, well, but climate change, how does that, how does that intersect? If you care about people, then you have to care about climate change. The planet will be here. We often talk about climate as like, oh, we have to save the Earth. The Earth is fine. It doesn't need your saving. <laughs> what needs your saving are people. People are the ones that are going to suffer. Earth will always be here, with or without us. But people need you. And so if you care about people in, in the least, then you need to pick care about climate change and you need to do whatever you can to engage within your sphere of influence, whether it's little things, doing little things day by day, and whether it's big things, voting, using, using your money wisely on who you invested in and where you invested, um, what products you buy, et cetera. I think that is something that's incredibly important that I'd love people to really engage in and, and, and work on. Sure. Uh, I'd like to say, get money out of politics and end uh, gerrymandering. Uh, so, we can have a rational government. Um, but uh, in the realm of reality, I mean, we have to find a way of talking about this issue in a way that resonates. I agree with, I agree with Esther, by the way. The most important thing we got to do, the only way that we're going to really protect immigrant communities in the next few years to, is to ensure there's another administration. Um, if there isn't, I mean, I, I don't know what I'll do. Um, but um, aside from that, we do, you know, let me just say this. It's, um, you know, I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, since 2007, I've been on and off uh, in the House working on trying to achieve bipartisan reforms um, with uh, members on the other side of the aisle. I think there's a lot more common ground, at least there is when, you know, members are, you know, in rooms trying to work together and try, you know, there's, you know, if you can listen to each other, understand the perspective of the other side, and uh, you know, there, there are ways of reaching compromise where they get uh, what they need politically and policy-wise, and we do as well. Um, there are a lot of other members on the other side of the aisle that um, who want and know that there needs to be a broad-based legalization of those who are here, particularly those who have been here a long time. And I think that is achievable if we can get to a space where compromise isn't a dirty word, where people aren't necessarily going to uh, you know, be thrown out of the office because they do compromise. But it's, so it's figuring out how we can, at both sides, come together and deliver on, uh, you know, long-lasting uh, legalization of the reforms to our immigration laws and not get booted out of office. That's, that's difficult. I know that, anyway, so that's what needs to be done. Thank you. So thank you all for joining us tonight for today's stream and the panel discussion on the future. So tonight is the last night of the film festival. We've enjoyed the films and the discussions that were had. And I'll just say one final thing. If you have any questions or want to get involved in the Exodus Institute, go to the website at www.theexodusinstitute.org. Thank you very much for being with us.